Hello once again, my dearest friends. So, it's been a while since I tackled the first half of the Ranch Bank series, and some of you may be asking as to why I've been taking my sweet ass time to get around to part two, and one of those reasons is that, sadly, some of these games here I just never really got around to playing just yet. As much as I hate to say this to you all in a video that is striving to praise this franchise for its many hours of entertainment, this is kind of where my interest in the series started to take a bit of a dip. Now I was still keeping up to date with the series, but as the years went on, the gap between when the games were coming out to when I was actually getting around to playing them was starting to lengthen more and more. As to why and when this happened, I'll go into that a bit later, but for now I just want you to know that this was a dip, not a descent, okay? So there was a happy ending to it all. As mentioned before, around the time games like Deadlock and Size Matters were slated to come out, the PS3 was not that far off from hitting the shelves itself. Naturally, Sony had some of their top men and women working to produce what would essentially be the next wave of PlayStation titles. Now, unlike Naughty Dog and Sucker Punch, who put most of their focus on creating new franchises for the PS3, Insomniac made the choice to not only keep the Ratchet Clank series afloat, but to also produce a second, more mature Sony exclusive series in the form of the Resistance franchise. Despite the increased workload, Insomniac was able to release two games within the PS3's release window, which leads us to the next big step in the Ratchet Clank series with 2007's Ratchet Clank Future Tools of Destruction. Before we tackle the ins and outs of the game itself, let's address the elephant in the room, shall we? Why have the word future in the title? Well, according to Somek, it was so as to welcome in a new era for the franchise. Thus, the next few games to come out during the PS3 were hereby dubbed part of the Future series. Even today, this naming decision still confuses the hell out of me. I mean, if the games have come and gone, shouldn't they be called the Past series now? And what do we call the series that we're currently in? The even more Future series? If that makes any sense. Now getting to see the next step for a beloved franchise is undoubtedly an exciting thing for any gamer that has a strong attachment to it, and considering that Crash and Spyro were really the only close franchises I personally had experienced a generation jump, I was a bit sceptical to say the least about Tools of Destruction. But just as Ranch Clank 1 got me to get a PS2, Tools of Destruction was very much the number one reason why I saved up a good chunk of a year's worth of paper and money so as to get a PS3 for Christmas that year. So in a way, here's your note repeating itself. The only slight difference, besides getting given Ratchet and Clank 1, is that, sadly, Tools of Destruction just didn't really hit it off with me. I mean, sure, it had its moments that felt like a Ratchet and Clank game, but there just seemed to be a sudden, well, lack of heart here. But before we decide what the hell I'm talking about, let's find out how the plot for this future series starts off with. The story kicks off with our heroes hanging out in Metropolis once again, when the city comes under attack by an army led by the high-pitched Emperor Tachyon. It turns out that decades ago in the Polaris Galaxy, Tachyon's species known as the Kragmites were in a long bloody war with the Lombaxes, which as a reminder to you all is what Ratchet's species is named. Eventually the Lombax has won somehow, but years later, Tachyon created his own empire and settled the score, leading to the Lombaxes disappearing from the universe. Having taken over the majority of the Polaris galaxy, Tachyon searched for various galaxies for Ratchet so as to finish off the Lombaxes once and for all. Err, uh, but uh, wasn't Angela in the second game also a lot? Anyway, Ratchet and Clank decide to head towards the Polaris galaxy so as to learn more about Ratchet's origin, as well as uncovering the mystery behind the Lombaxes' disappearance. Along the way, they join forces with an explorer's daughter named Talon, her two veteran bodyguards, Kronk and Zeth, Quark, who just shows up now and then, and these mysterious little creatures known as Zonies, who possess time-like abilities and seem to show much interest in Clank for some reason. While they do spend most of their time fighting against Tachyon's forces, they also cross swords with Captain Romulus Slag and his robotic pirate crew. So the story this time around is very much centered around the idea of building more of a backstory behind one of our two heroes, with this chapter in the series looking to explore more about Ratchet's inner demons and his ongoing need to find out why he was left behind. I'm sorry to bring this up, but spoiler alert, Ratchet's origin is basically just a few notches away from Superman's. In fact, now that I think about it, there's a lot of things that connect the two of them together. I mean, think about it. He spends most of his time in a city named Metropolis. His villain roster consists of a powerful businessman, a crazed robot, someone connected with his past, okay, that one's a bit of a stretch, a female who has supernatural powers, and an occasional nemesis who thinks very highly of himself and just so happens to have a big chin. I know this is probably outdated by now, but, mm. Boom. But anyway, I guess I should address what it is that kind of turns me off about this particular game in the franchise. So you know how I mentioned in my previous video that I was sort of annoyed with how linear they were getting with Up Your Ass, No One Onwards? Well, yeah, it's very much present here as well. But while Up Your Arsenal did narrow things down, its story at least kept me interested. 
In Tools of Destruction, things just really seem to slow down at times, especially in the middle of the game. What's more, the Plast Galaxy doesn't really have anything outside of the Pirates that really makes it stand out in comparison to the Salon and Bogon Galaxies. One thing I know would have helped with this would have been if we had any supporting characters around to make this galaxy feel alive, but instead all we're left with is this smuggler guy who keeps showing up now and then. It just feels very empty to me. Okay, let's just skip to the part where I talk about things that I did like here. One thing that certainly stuck out when returning to this game was how badass the weapons got this time around with many of them managing to not just be slightly altered versions of past ones we've seen before. On top of that, we also confusingly have grenade-like weapons this time that only require you to pay for ammo. I don't know why these aren't just like any other gun, but they do provide us with some mainstays like the murderous robotic Mr. Zerko, and of course the highly popular Groovatron. I honestly have to wonder what the people in Somek really think about the inclusion of this weapon. On the one hand, it's their most creative and hilarious weapon to date, on the other hand, the animators have to go through the exhausting task of designing dance moves for every enemy, side character, and boss in the entire game. So regardless of any issues I have with this game, I at least have to tip my hat to all the hard work that went into making this one unique weapon. As with before, you can always level up weapons, but you can now also collect rare titanium to use in each weapon's upgrade tree. This includes such things as damage increase, rate of fire, range, lasting time, and bolt collecting. While we still have the arena battles and collecting set items for bolts, this time being Leviathan Souls. We also have these rail shooter levels where you get to pilot your ship similar to playing as Giant Clank in Size Matters. While these levels are gorgeous to look at, even today, they sadly feel a little meaningless and just a tad too slow for my taste. I actually kind of dreaded it when they turn up each time. As with the gadgets, they've sadly taken another hit, with most of them just being repeats of past ones. The only new ones we really get are just the Gelinator that lets you create box-shaped blobs that you can jump on, and the Gyrocycle that lets you ride in these hamster ball-like sections of the game. If I can squeeze one last major complaint in, I want to talk a bit about Tachyon. Now I will say that there is somewhat of a deep and complex backstory behind this guy, but rather than that being the first thing I associate with him, all I can really think about is how See the crown? See the scepter? A giant walking throne? A legion of loyal robotic commandos? Emperor! What have you done? You've ruined everything! It's how he won't shut up! We're told the basic details about how Tachyon was left behind after the Kragmites were defeated, and how he was raised by the Lombaxes only to discover the truth later in his life, but that's it. Was he ostracised? Was he oversheltered? I feel if they just changed a few things around, he could have been so much more compelling and left a much greater impact on me. While I'm sure there's plenty of things people disagree with me on here, the one thing I'm fairly confident got under everyone's skin was the game's heavy inclusion of 6-axis motion controls, which at this point Sony was still trying to make a thing. So as I made it clear by now, this game didn't exactly click with me like I was hoping it would, but I do appreciate them for trying something different with the story, and I can't deny how badass the weapons got. Yes, things could have been better in my opinion, but that's what soon see it did lead to greater things later down the line. So I don't know what it is, but I have the sneaking suspicion that some people in Sonic might have had a bit of a space pirate obsession for a while. We've gone from having a brief minigame level themed after them, to having them as a secondary antagonist to a game, to having an entire game themed around them. But I say that with the most fragile of words, because Quest for Booty isn't exactly what I call a full glass here. In fact, you can almost go right ahead and just label this game as DLC for Tools of Destruction, just from all the things they copied over, and what little innovation this game brings to the table. Now in order for me to talk about the story for Quest for Booty, it is worth noting that I will be talking about the last few seconds for Tools Destruction, so... So after our defeat of Tachyon, the Zoni show up once again and end up abducting Clank for unknown reasons. With little to go on, Ratchet and Talon find out that the only known person to have made contact with the Zoni is the dreaded pirate Captain Darkwater. Unfortunately for them, Darkwater was slag superior until he took command the way that most pirates do. Thus, Ratchet and Talon head to the planet of Murdergrory in order to uncover Darkwater's lost secrets to locating the Zoni, all having to contain with robotic and undead pirates. So to put it bluntly, this game is short, like really short, to the point that I do kind of just recommend maybe be watching the game's ending on YouTube, but with that said, there are a few things here that might pique your interest. For example, one thing I feel we get a lot more focus on this time is platforming. A good chunk of time this game is spent in locations that really don't require much shooting up enemies. However, as I mentioned before, nothing is really new here with all the weapons just being ones moved over from Tools of Destruction. The only new additions we do have is the kinetic tether for our wrench, allowing us to move various objects around, and we can now pick up and throw objects like these exploding rocks or these glow-in-the-dark blob creatures. We also get a few puzzles later on that are fun for 
thought they are, but certainly not that hard for anyone to crack. I must say though, for a game that's themed around pirates, I didn't exactly feel very pirate-like most of the time. Sure, the enemies in some of the locations are there, but what about us? When Assassin's Creed 4 showed up, it gave us sailing, sea battles, treasure hunting, and much more. Here, Ratchet just feels the same, which is kind of sad given how awesome it would be to have some pirate-themed weapons. Hell, I could come up with five ideas on the spot right now. Anyway, if you want to spend 10 quid on a game that took me two and a half hours to complete, then there might be something here for you, but in all honesty, it might just be best just to skip to the next one in the series. So up to this point in the chronicling of the Ratchet Clank series, I've played every game excluding size matters around its time of release. But Ratchet Clank Cracking Time came out in a very overcrowded year, and due to my unfortunate disappointment with Tools Destruction, it wasn't exactly at the top of my list. Now I did eventually get around to picking it up, three years after its release, but that doesn't mean I wasn't excited to play it, especially after hearing all the positive reviews it got. Then again, Tools Destruction also got quite a few positive reviews, so... Continuing on with the story from the previous two games, Clank is being cared for by the Zoni, who are attempting to repair him after being damaged for reasons. Of course, as we find out at the end of the quest for booty, the Zoni have hired Ratchet and Clank's pastime nemesis, Dr. Nefarious, to repair Clank with them unaware of his evil intentions. After Clank manages to escape, he learns that he's currently on what is known as the Great Clock, an ancient space station of sorts sitting in the centre of the universe that was created to keep time from going haywire after people abuse time travel too much. He also learns that rather than being built in one of Chairman Jerk's factories, it was instead built by the Zoni's leader and caretaker of the clock, known as Orvis. With the clock damaged by Nefarious, Clank takes up the task of repairing it while also being trained by the clock's junior caretaker, Sigmund, as well as from recordings left by Orvis so as to use his newly discovered time-based abilities. Whilst this was happening, Ratchet and Tal, I mean Quark, for some reason, come across a section within the Polaris galaxy that has been experiencing time-based anomalies. Soon enough, Ratchet comes into contact with General Alistair Amazov, the only other Lombax he left behind, again besides Angela. Alistair also seeks the clock in order to rewrite his past mistakes, thus he aids Ratchet in his quest to reunite with his best friend and fought Nefarious' plans. Now if you were to compare this game to Tools Destruction, you could probably pick out a few similarities. I mean, we're still in the Polaris Galaxy, technically, the story is focused more on the characters again, and the game is very linear-like. And yet, surprisingly, a lot of it really works here for me. One of the things I know was done a lot better was the way they gave the Polaris Galaxy so much more personality this time. While we still sort of don't get any side characters similar to the ones found in those first few games, we are given a much better insight here thanks to the many different species you'll come across and the worlds they inhabit. It goes to show just what putting in a little bit of character into these worlds can really do. I think my favourite species have to be this unadvanced tribe lot known as the Fungoids, just for how naive they can be at times. Have you met Dr. Nefarious yet? <laughs> He's great and wonderful! So while he was spending most of the time apart for this game, we're given two different experiences this time around, with one being very familiar to us, while the other is something very new. Naturally, Ratchet is the most similar to what's come before, but for the first time, we can actually now control our spaceship when traveling to different planets. This allows for ship battles against various foes, as well as letting you uncover and explore tiny little planets, so as to find lost Zonies, gold bolts, as well as customizable parts for weapons. Most common types of mini planets will tend to be either ones that have you killing a set number of enemies, or platforming based ones usually surrounded by lava or quicksand. There are also times where you can help out random people and even take out enemy satellites. While well, the gold bolts and weapon parts are optional, you are required to collect Zoni so as to upgrade your ship and gain access to various planets throughout the story. The fact this is all here is a big plus in my book. Sure, it's not as deep as intriguing as most open world RPGs we see today, but it still provides an alternative to just going from planet to planet. While well, Clank may be gone for most of the game, and our list of gadgets is still smaller to what they've been in the past, we do get some pretty handy and inventive ones this time around. The charge boots, which first appeared in Going Commando, have not only returned, but have now been redesigned so as to move around a lot more easy like, as opposed to before, where you could really only go in one direction. We also get the Omni Soak, which allows us to absorb liquids like water and oil and use them as projectiles. As mentioned before, you can now customise weapons for the first time, but there are a few limitations. For example, when I say weapons, I really mean three of them represented by the usual blaster, bomb launcher and shotgun weapons. Each weapon comes with three sections to alter with three parts to pick from. I did find myself switching out the parts often, and I have to be honest here, you can really feel the difference with each of them. Plus you can even pick out which paint jobs you want for each of them. One thing I'm sort of surprised didn't make a return with the weapon upgrade trees from Tools Destruction. I guess maybe they thought the game was a little overstuffed, especially with the weapon customising and ship upgrades. Personally their absence wasn't really an issue here for me. But let's talk about the other side of this game with Clank. I guess I should first mention that while the concept of designing puzzles around a character with the ability to control time is creative, it has sadly been done before with the likes of Braid and Blinks the Time Sweeper. That said,
said, it is still very inventively done here and every time I got a lot of satisfaction from completing each puzzle. The main mechanic surrounding these puzzles involves Clank recording copies of himself so as to reach the end of the room and exit through the door. As things move forward, you have to adapt your mind based on your timing and where each of your recordings goes. It can really test you here, especially with the free hidden puzzles available near the end of the game. Going back to the story, I just want to say how much fun Dr. Nefarious was here. He was already pretty memorable and up your arsenal, but here he's just on the ball and it's all down to Armin Shimmer's performance along with how well he's animated. Despite the story centering most on Clank this time, we are almost given the same intention to Ratchet thanks to the addition of Alistair, who helps provide a different side to the Lombax race and acts very much as a mentor figure that Ratchet never had. Although just like Peppy from Star Fox, I feel like there is way too much of him talking about Ratchet's dad or how Ratchet is just like him. My dear boy. Look just like your father. You're reminding me more of your father every day. You're becoming more like your father. Speaking of dads, Orphus is pretty enjoyable, even if we don't technically interact with the real one. Also, I find it funny that on top of him being played by the voice of Mario, Charles Marnette, we get this line used in the game. Are you coming? Plumbers don't just go diving down strange pipes all willy-nilly. That'd be ridiculous. While well, I still consider Going Commander to be a prime example of what a Ratchet & Clank game is at its best, A Kraken Time serves as a nice alternative to those who prefer a more modern outing of the two. So in summary, this game was a really enjoyable time for me. The new inclusions felt like a huge leap for this series, the puzzles do a good job of really testing your brain, and the story is one of the best in this series thanks to its focus on the bond between our two heroes. So after being around for the series for almost 10 years now, and Sonic decided it seemed like the opportune time to experiment with the Ratchet Clank series, where we see a game that was primarily focused on cold play this time, rather than being an alternative like it was in Deadlock. There is a part of me that wonders to whether this was something that fans have been asking for, or if in Sonic was feeling like the series was maybe getting a little too repetitive. At some point in Ratchet Clank's long and sort of confusing timeline, the duo have apparently retired from being galactic heroes, and Quark has somehow become the president of the Polaris Galaxy. That's right folks, Captain Quark is now the president. President. I don't even need to make any comparison jokes, they're just too easy. Although, I will say congratulations once again Insomniac for making a very soft prediction that turned out to be more true than we thought. Well anyway, the three are lured into trap by Nefarious, but are soon abducted by an unknown force and brought to the planet of Magnus. They soon learn the craft that brought the four of them is known as Ephemeris and has been abducting some of the galaxy's most dangerous beasts and dropping them on Magnus for over a hundred years. In order for them to save the planet's inhabitants and escape, the four agree to work together in taking down Ephemeris. Now I'm already going to go ahead and say that my opinion of this game might not be the most solid here, considering that the game is intended to be played up to four players and I really just ended up completing it on my own while also playing a few levels with a friend later on. So of all the games I've talked about here, this is the one you should probably take with a grain of salt. Naturally, because the game's focus is on co-op, almost the entire gameplay structure has shifted so as to fit a format that works best for all players. Naturally, the game is very linear, but I guess I can't really hold that against it this time. That, or I just don't really care to complain here. While the gameplay still has you using a variety of different weapons, they never really have the same spark as with the previous games. And not because they feel unoriginal, even if some are copied over, but just from how everything is structured with them. You also get a few gadgets here and there, though you almost just keep using the vacuum to launch allies across gaps and suck up bolts fast. One thing that certainly bothers me in this game are the character designs from the main cast. Ratchet's face just seems off most of the time, Clank looks like he's left DK mode on himself, and Quark... just... Why? But while the character designs may be off-putting, I will say the game looks decent enough, even for a game that came out in 2011. I do have to wonder if the game's more softer art direction was intentionally chosen to bring in a much more younger audience this time. If that was the case, I must say I'm quite surprised at some of the more not-so-child-friendly lines left in. You did the right thing, Doctor! What's more surprising though is when you find out, in keeping with the past few games double entendres, All For One was originally going to be called Ratchet & Clank 4Play. Yeah, I can't imagine why that one didn't get the thumbs up this time. The yeah, air wasn't so bad while playing alone, however I will say there were occasional moments that I swear it picked up on our human ability to dick around with our friends. So, you gonna kill him Clank? Like, any day now? Huh? Now maybe? Oh, 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 okay, I'm, I'm dead now. Thanks, great, thanks for that, Clank. As a co-op game, it's alright, but there are plenty of others that I can think of that are likely to serve you and your friends better. As a solo player game, though, yeah, you can just go ahead and miss this one. This game might have been trying to do something different, and I guess I can't fault them for that. I mean, look at the Mario series. But I just wish they could have landed on their feet a bit better, is all. Now, when Ratchet & Clank Internet Nexus was announced, or just Ratchet & Clank Nexus in Europe, because... 
I honestly have no idea by this point, there were two things I remember Insomniac making clear to us all. One, it was not aiming to be a full length game, but rather the average length of half of one. And two, it would be bringing back the split path design that had all but disappeared by Tools of Destruction. Naturally, the latter caught my eye, but did it still manage to be as worthy as those before it? Into the Nexus was intended to be the finale to the future series, with the story still containing roots all the way back to its beginning, though it certainly wasn't as big of a continuation as Kraken Time was a tool to destruction. I do like though that the story makes references to past events and how they play here. The story starts with a news report informing us that over six months ago, the CEO of Pollux Industries was kidnapped by criminal twins Ventra and Nifton Prog. While Nifton went into hiding with the CEO, Ventra was captured and put into cryosleep due to her unusual supernatural powers she possesses. I should probably mention that around Internex's release, a mobile game for the iOS and Android was created that goes into a bit more detail into Ratchet Clank's first encounter with the twins. I talk more about it, but... Well, there's no way to put it, I just have no real interest in playing this game. Anyway, while Venger is being moved into a high-level prison, Tawin, who is back from her random disappearance in Kraken Time, has asked Ratchet Clank to help with her transfer, which, as you can expect, doesn't turn out too good, with Venger escaping and Kronk and Zephyr sadly losing their lives in the process. In order to avenge their friends and stop whatever plans the twins have, Ratchet Clank must do what they can to save the universe from the unknown creatures known as the Nevers. Like Quest for Booty, because this game's short lifespan, there's not that much to talk about here, but I'll do my best. Internex has tried to have a very gravity based theme to it all, with you utilising different gravity mechanics throughout the plants you'll be going to. The most common being the grab tether that allows you to create beams that you can use to move from point to point that are kind of ripped straight from Portal 2 now that I think about it. We also get a nice return of the jetpack, first introduced in Going Commando, you now being able to fly much longer as well as using weapons. This is mostly shown off on a whole planet dedicated to just letting you fly around and collecting stuff. There are also a few times you'll play as Clank in these gravity challenges that will have you navigating through another dimension while controlling the flow of gravity. We get a few neat additions to the weapons this time, like the Winterizer that turns enemies into snowmen, and the Nightmare Box that stuns enemies with fear and sort of fills in for the Groovatron this time. You also get to have Mr. Zerko again, with the addition of his wife and son this time. Despite the game's length, the Sonic did manage to fit in Batarinas once again, and as mentioned, we get a planet where we get to freely hunt down gaffer horns for bolts. I will say I wish we could have seen more choice in which paths to take, as we certainly don't get to see the same kind of objective-based freedom that was in the first and second game to the series. I should probably talk about the villains. Both Vindra and Neftin are pretty much what I really wish Tachyon had been like. We not only find lots about why they became criminals in the first place, but we also kind of sympathise with them a bit. Despite her gender, Vendra is something very different than what we've seen before, with her reflecting the same kind of desperation that Ratchet had in Tools of Destruction. Even Nefton surprised me. I like the fact that despite him looking like he's just there to be the muscle, he does prove to be technically proficient and not just the usual all brawn, no brains kind of guy. It's just a real shame that we don't get to see more of them due to this game's short length. There's one last thing I want to bring up, and that's the museum used in the last level. I haven't talked about this yet, mostly because I didn't know where to insert it in, but Sonic loves to show people the many secrets behind almost each Ratchet and Clank's game's development for a hidden, ever changing location simply known as the Insomniac. Museum. It's here we can find out more about some of their unusual ideas, as well as other factoids. Vinter Nexus, which are a proper museum this time around that goes into the hero's many adventures, as well as all the allies and villains they've come across. We even get a nice statue dedicated to Dan Johnson, a former Insomniac employee who sadly died in 2006. Considering the fact that Dan made multiple Easter egg appearances before his death, like finding his face on a hidden snowman, or being able to unlock playable skins of him, you can get a good idea of how valuable this guy was as a game designer or a friend to the many people in Insomniac. Anyway, overall, Vinter Nexus is a fine Ratchet and Clank game with some nice mechanics thrown in, with only 5 planets to explore, this game just feels a little unfulfilling as all. I still do have a recommend it though for its weapons, gravity mechanics, and its way of handling its story. Just don't be surprised by its length is all. Now before we get to our grand finale, let's talk about some of the other little Ratchet and Clank material that's out there that... Honestly, I just didn't really want to get too much into. Starting off with Ratchet and Clank Full Frontal Assault. Next is Secret Agent Clank. This is one I probably should have picked up, but unlike that game, which I simply had a bad feeling about, Full Frontal Assault I simply didn't want to play because honestly, I'm just not that big of a fan of tower defense games, even when they do manage to throw you a curveball like with Toy Soldier or Dungeon Defenders. There is technically a story to this game, but from the looks of it, it really is nothing important. As a game to commemorate 10 years of Ratchet and Clank history, I really feel like they could have picked out something better. I talked before about the mobile game before next. Nexus, but it actually wasn't the franchise's first dip into the mobile market. In fact, their first time was back in 2005 with Ratchet and Clank going mobile. I'd like to think I at least get a pass for missing this one out, considering I don't know how I would play it nowadays. One other form of media the duo have featured in besides film is a six issue comic book series published by Wildstorm and written by one of the head writers from the last few games. The story involves Ratchet and Clank working to stop a guy named Artemis Zog from stealing planets and teleporting them to his newly governed artificial galaxy. Because Zog ends up stealing planets from both the Bogon and Solana galaxies, we get to see 
characters like Sasha, her father, and Al return, which I'm very happy to see. We also get some revelations to things like why Ratchet and Clank decide to be retired in All for One, or what happened to Tawin's father in Tool's destruction, or how someone like Tra, I mean, Quark became president. I will admit I'm no expert on comics, but for a six part series, I found it to be really great, with colourful art used on every page, dialogue that seems to fit in well with the game's clever writing, and it does a good job of bringing together some of the series' favourite characters to stop a pretty well developed adversary. Reading through it all now, it actually makes me a little sad they've technically gone on reboot on the series. Sure, they can easily bring characters back, as nothing's really changed that much, but this comic is a great reminder of just how far our heroes had come. And I guess I should talk a bit about the film, of course. In all honesty, I didn't think the film was that bad. I thought they did a decent job when it came to replicating the charm found within the series, and there were some nice easter eggs here and there, where it drops the most of my opinions with the pacing. It feels like we aren't really given enough time to really see the bond between Ratchet and Clank form, or given a firm grasp of the universe they are trying to save, something the games do very well at. And while there were a few jokes that got a chuck out of me, some jokes just felt too dated and just didn't belong in something Ratchet and Clank related. It's funny because the guy who directed this also directed the 2007 TMNT movie that I also enjoyed. It's just that I had some things that just didn't work in a Ninja Turtles movie. Fun fact, both Ratchet's voice actors provide the voice for two of the Ninja Turtles. Makes me wonder if the two were ever in the same room together and the topic of Ratchet and Clank ever turned up. Over the Ratchet and Clank movie is one of the better video game movies next to Tomb Raider, Silent Hill and Prince of Persia, but yeah, I'm kind of disappointed it didn't get to be the first video game movie adaptation to work out. Although I must say, I do find that 17% score ads and Rotten Tomato to be a little harsh, especially when things like Cars 2 and Shark Tale are around. So I guess we're done here, right? No other ones to go over? Just done? <sighs> okay, fine. One more. I'm not exactly sure how I felt when they announced the 2016 reimagining of the original Ratchet and Clank that would accompany the upcoming movie. On the one hand, it would be a very nostalgic experience, providing a huge update on previous levels and would allow all newcomers to access the series a lot easier. On the other hand though, the story could be poorly paced thanks to the original plot being replaced with the one from the movie, and the level design could easily be outdated at this point. But in the end, it seems to turn out pretty good in my opinion. Not perfect, to be sure, but still pretty good. The premise follows the original game decently enough with the only real big difference being how Ratchet and Clank are working alongside the Galactic Rangers this time. There are other things as well that are scattered about that have also changed. For example, there's no part in the middle where the two heroes are at odds with one another, our reasons for going to each planet are mostly different from before, and two or three new locations have been added in due to their relevance to the film's story. Now for the most part, the actual layout of the levels are fairly spot on, with a few bits here and there that are either removed or expanded upon so as to match up with the more action focused games of today. To answer my question from before, I do think the old layout still works with the current gameplay used in the series today. Day, mostly because, just like Mario, there hasn't really been that much of a huge shift in how our heroes used to play to how they do now. Pretty much all the gadgets from the original are here, with the inclusion of the jetpack from Nexus getting dropped in as well. Almost all the weapons are ones we've seen before, with the exception of the proto drum and the pixelizer, but I will say it doesn't really bother me here as much as it does this time, just how visually polished they are thanks to the graphical boost the PS4 provides. One big change to note is that for the first time we don't have skill points to earn. What we do have instead are holo cards, which can be earned by defeating enemies, finding them in hidden spots or even winning them. Each one is based on something in Ratchet Clank's past, like characters, locations, and weapons, and also come with bonuses as well as factoids with them. As I said before, the story is very similar to the original Ratchet Clank, but it sadly suffers from how it tries to merge the game with the film. Scenes taken from the movie stick out when jumping between the quality of animation, and when you look at the story from an outsider's perspective, it sort of feels like you're just doing things so as to pad things out until you hit the third act of the movie. See so what you will about Ratchet Clank arguing in the original, and these help cut things up and allow the bond between the two of them to really grow over the course of the game. I guess it can't be too hard on them seeing as how they are pretty much having to fight two entities here, but it's still a problem that's hard to overlook. In short, this game could be a real fun time, and if you or someone you know has never gotten around to playing the series yet, well, there has really never been a better time than right now. And that, my friends, concludes our look back on one of the game's most beloved series. I hope you enjoy these videos, I apologise if they seem a bit long, but I thought they worked out pretty good, and who knows, I might just continue this format with another franchise, you know, maybe one that came around the same time and was also owned by PlayStation and also able to include two heroes, you know, who, um, you know, did platforming and stuff like that and occasionally used guns and stuff like that, you know, so... Just saying. So thank you all for tuning in. If you haven't liked this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, even more hot cost goodness, and you can check me out on Facebook and Twitter. Fans again, guys, and hey, be seeing you around.